A very good day, a morning to all of you. Welcome to our first fruits of teaching and celebration wherever you are. Now we have decided to put in this live casting, live streaming at 10 o'clock in the morning just so that wherever you are, you are able to tune in. I know many of us, we are missing the corporate gathering, the meeting together. But we are hoping very soon to be able to come back and there will be a path to normalcy. Now, today we have many events coming out later in the afternoon. We have the Tribe Advancing School uh, for Confucius Spirit Part 2. If you have missed, uh, if you have not registered, do register. And Part 1 is also available. Then tonight, there is the First Fruit Celebration with Cebu. You know, they do it through Zoom with more interaction, with worship. So you will want to tag along that as well. Now, for us today, we, we want to continue to go into the right mindset of first fruit, the right mindset of giving God the first. So for this month, I want to talk about prospering in the midst of great challenge because we are still going through a path of challenge here. So once again, welcome to the first fruit gatherings for the month of Av. Now first fruit is always a time for us to be prophetically set for the month ahead. That is the reason we do it right at the beginning of the month so that everything we learned, our first worship, it will have the effect, it will help us to apply it throughout the month. See, prophetically set, it basically means that there is a prophetic path which the Lord wants us to unlock. So there is something to be unlocked and then we can go through it, we can begin to reap and, and experience the benefit. The key, the key to first fruit really lies in, in our understanding and then our response, you know, our choices with regards to the first principle. So another way to look at it is to see like a prophetic portal. Now, every time we come for corporate worship, that, that's why I really enjoy the, the Judah session, the worship session, because there is such an atmosphere of open heaven. It, it's like there is a portal that opens up, it activates something in us when we choose to worship God with our first. Now, some of you will be asking, what are the first worship that you're talking about? And it, it is in relation to the finance that we have, the time that we have, the emotions, the submissions, you know, every aspect of life that we can begin to hand it to God and say, Lord, this is my very best. Take it, use it, however you want. And then you begin to see there is just such a transaction, there is such a transference of anointing that causes us to advance. Now, first fruit, I already say, is a choice. We have to uh, make a decision to step into that. But it is also practical. So many people have asked me, you know, how do I give first fruit? You know, is there a formula? There is no formula because it is an interaction between you and God. Now, I know some of you will be like, oh, you know, can I give a specific amount? Can I use a formula? You, you can do what you believe. You can do what you feel the Lord is leading you. But one of the things that I do is I, I want to give first fruit, especially the financial part of first fruit. I want to give it right at the beginning of the month. Now, the reason is very simple. When you give your best, it will sanctify the rest. So that means when you give the small portion which represents your best, God will ensure everything else is preserved. Everything else will not be lost. So if you do it at the end of the month or you do it at your salary cycle, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Remember when we give first fruit, there is no legalistic manner to do it. But when you do that, then you are missing out certain portion of the timing. But this is something that you can develop. This is something that you can think about and allow the Lord to speak into your spirit so that you begin to express in a way that honors Him in the very best possible way. Now, last month, uh, the month of Tammuz, we talked about the developments and the cultivations of our own worship because it is so important in a time where we are not able to come together. We learn to worship on our own. We talk about three levels of worship. There's a personal worship. That's a worship that you, you can do on your own. There's a tribe worship when you come together as a group. 
But now, since we cannot meet, it, it, you have to be, we have to begin to learn how to worship with our family, how to worship in a micro church setting. Then, of course, corporate corporate is really the overall expression in the body of Christ. See, the ability to worship on our own is very important. It's very critical because we need to be able to draw near to God to be able to discern and hear His voice. We must learn how to worship, I already mentioned, within the context of our family, but also smaller circle because we're not sure how long uh, we, we will remain in this sort of situation where we cannot come and have that corporate time together. But in the meantime, we really have to develop this ability in smaller groups and sometimes you have to use creative ways in, in chat groups, video, you know, whatever that works for you that will cause you to have that worship experience to, to be able to draw near to God. Now, the law will also cause micro churches. Now, this is a time for micro churches to rise up. And I know some of you will be like, I can't even go to work. What kind of micro churches? You see, micro churches is not just in the workplace. It can be in the workplace, but it, it is just that, that congregation, that, that kind of meeting with, with just a few people, two or three people, when you pray, when you intercede, begin to hear the voice of God, the revelation of God, the strategies flows down. There will be the kingdom advancing activities. And I, I'm very certain the Lord is going to cause micro churches to advance even in this time of restrictive movement and, and pandemic, okay? So I, as we come to the final three months, so if we talk about from the yearly Hebrew year perspective, we're coming to the last three months of five, seven, eight ones. We will begin to receive further strategies that allow us to finish well. We want to finish the yearly cycle well and we want to be ready for the next you know, we call it, the, the, the Hebrew calendar, they call it the head of the year, you know. So the next year will be 5, 7, 8, 2, where they will receive, they, they, there is a prophetic revelation in terms of how we should be approaching the year. See, the whole point of prophetic is really to give us that framework, to give us that guidance at all times. We are able to draw into the, the voice of God. We are able to go into the throne room of God that allows us to have strategies to advance. So, so just a quick reminder, 5781, you know, from the yearly perspective, we're, we're drawing to the, the, to the last three months, but the year is called Pei Elif, and you have seen this picture many, many times. It, it's a year of contrast. It's a year of contention. It, you know, the red dragon is trying to create fear and, and suppress the voice of the saints. But, everyone says, but, if we allowed the, the, the voice of the Lion of Judah to come out through us, that means we will be roaring like the Lion of Judah, then we will be able to, to kind of resist. You see, the, the whole thing is really, you're, you're not going to escape this earth. You're not going to say, I, I, I want to be free, you know, fully free from the effects and consequences of the red dragon, of the pandemic. We're not going to be able to do that immediately, but by the grace of God and the voice of the lion, we'll be able to resist. We'll be able to hear the truth and do things accordingly. So, so let's not lose sight of the prophetic theme of the year and as we try to finish off strongly this year. So very quickly, God's calendar. So now we're in the month of Av. So if you look at the calendar, that's around 7, 8 o'clock. Then we're coming to Elu, which is the, the last month if we follow the yearly cycle. Then Tishrei we, is what we call head of the year. So that's the old Hebrew calendar, 5, 7, 8, 2 will begin. But of course, we, we, we saw from Exodus, the Lord changed the month. So Nisan become the first month from a monthly perspective, okay? So now, I'll talk about this in another time, but it, it is important. For now, it, we, we just need to understand that in terms of the prophetic revelation for 5781, we are coming to an end and we want to finish off strongly. So here's a quick overview of the last three months. So last month, Tammuz, time to reorder our worship we talk about dealing with the golden calf, whatever uh, the idol that is within our heart, 
And, and then we, we talk about the spies, you know, how do we deal with the false reports. So I'm going to talk a little bit more today on that, okay? So this is now the month of Av. We, are, we want to talk about how even in the midst of great trials and challenges, we can still prosper. Everyone says prosper. Because prosper, prosperity, it is something that God wants us to have. And, and then we want to be able to discern the minority report now. Of course, if you study the story of the, the 12 spies, you, you know, they all came back, 10 gave a, a bad report, 2 gave a good report. So that is what we call the minority report. I'll talk more about that a bit later. Then, Elu, next month, here's a preview. We want to be able to advance to a place where we can see the light. So it's like we're able to go through this difficult time, finish the year well, and then God will come. He will be in the field and begin to help us, cause us to advance. So let's come back to the month of Av. So remember I talked about the, the yearly perspective is coming to an end, but if we talk about from the monthly perspective, the first month starts in Passover the month of Nisan. So from that perspective, this is the fifth month, okay? So God's timing and cycle is very interesting. It overlaps. That's why it is a circular way of looking at things. That means there is cycle and things happen before will affect what we're doing now and also going into the future. So I already mentioned about the yearly perspective. We're in the final phase of 5, 7, 8, 1. Just now you just saw the picture between the red dragons and the lion of Judah. It is a year of contention. 5, 7, 8, 1 has been a year of contrast. The clashes of territorial forces, both in the natural and in the spiritual. See, on one hand, you have the red dragon. And the red dragon is creating a worldwide fear. So now the red dragon, by the way, is in Revelation 12. And it, is a, it, it causes a worldwide fear of doom and gloom. So, so many people are experiencing hope deferred. So many people are fearful for their life. They are fearful for the future. They are not sure if the life they know, they experience once upon a time, will come back again. Yet, the Lord wants us to prosper. In the midst of the red dragon being crazy and unleashing his fire and his fury, the Lord wants us to prosper. So this is one of the major themes for the month of Av. That even though the enemy tries to shake you down, the enemy tries to cause you to disobey God, we can choose a better way. We can choose a superior way. So that's why the month of Av, it is all about recognizing the contrast. We need to see the good, we need to see the bad, and then we have to make a decision. We can choose the superior kingdom way. Now, prosperity, we talk about prosperity, it's not to prosper. It, it is really a choice. So, the month of Av, there are several choices for us to consider and to make. You see, the first thing, of course, is there is a voice of God there is the voice of unbelief. There is the Spirit of God. There is the human flesh. So it, it, it is always in contradiction. It is always in, in strife and fighting, okay? Then we have the true report. Remember the minority report. We have the false report, even though it is majority. Then this is the month we can choose blessings or we can choose curses because you can only choose either one. If there is no blessing, that means you are in curses. There's no such place as I'm in a neutral place or I'm sitting on a fence. You either have blessings or you have curses. So I already mentioned about the, the, the majority report versus the minority report. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by group think. There is the kind of voice, it's almost like a mind control spirit that begins to cause people to have a particular way of thinking that is not from God. We have world system versus kingdom expression. You see, king, the kingdom of God has freedom. It, it has joy. It has peace. You know, all the good things. But the world system, it is like the Egyptian system. It's like the Pharaoh system. It is a slavery system. Okay? So our choices must be based on who God is. So you see, at the end of the day, it comes down to what is your relationship with God. 
who do you know who God is? Do you have a relationship with God? And, and that's why we cannot be swayed by the false prophets out there, you know, who, who, who will be saying a certain things that... Now, now, how do you tell if someone is really prophesying something that is false? Now, I'm not even talking about, you know, prophesying as in proper prophesying, but, you know, just, you know, people out there just talking all kind of nonsense when it causes you to have fear for the future, when it causes you to doubt the goodness of God. That, that is really some of the hallmark for false prophets. Now, and we're not getting into there, but this is just to lay the context for this month. So in these three months, we talk about, you know, last month, Tammuz to, to, to Av and then Elu. The law is causing, there, there, is, there will be an uprooting of systems because we have bloodline issues, we have certain things that we have done that causes us not to be able to advance. So in the midst of uh, getting through to, to hear the real voice of God, the law is also uprooting certain things so that we will be free from the bondages. So there will be a lot of deliverance. There will be a lot of healing. If we allow God to do it, He will cause us to come to a place from a very narrow place to a wide open field in the month of Elu. See, many Christians fear the word prosperity. You know, I, I remember a few years ago, you know, prosperity, people just say, oh, prosperity gospel is very bad. You know, these days we don't hear so much of that. Now, this is due to some historical unbalanced teaching. So, so one of the worst teaching of uh, prosperity is what we call the name it, get it doctrine. You know, they say, if you just say you want this and God will, will give you. You say, I, I want an island, God will give you an island. I want a jet, you'll get a jet. So, so it doesn't work like that. Faith doesn't work like that. It, it is not magic. It is not like you demand and you get it. But faith is based on relationship with God. Faith is knowing the heart of God. You see, but this doesn't mean there's no prosperity because the Word of God is all about prospering. I mean, if you take prosperity out from the Bible, I'm not sure how much is left there. Because when the Lord created the garden, there's a boundary of garden. And from there, from the central place, Adam and Eve, were able to prosper. So you see, God wanted us to prosper, but within a boundary. They, they has, we have to operate within that boundary. Otherwise, there will be no prosperity. You see, to prosper, it means to have blessings that allow one to fulfill his or her destiny. So here we begin to see that the prosperity, the blessing, is so that you and I can fulfill our destiny. Not for anything else. It's not for enjoyment. It's not for you to receive things and you don't do anything. And it will happen within a time and season. You see, to prosper essentially means we have to overcome. So there is that barrier, there is that resistance, there is that warfare. If we overcome, then we can win. You see, prosperity is not something that is handed over to you just like that. You are not being spoon-fed. You know, we talk about babies being spoon-fed, but as we attain, attain a level of maturity, God doesn't spoon feed anymore. Instead, He gave us the power to wage war. We, we have been given authority to engage the enemies of God. We have been given authority and the anointing and the ability to create wealth so that the kingdom of God can be advanced. So that's why at the end of the day, to prosper, to have prosperity, it is part of kingdom advancement. We fulfill the mandate, but not in, just in any way. You know, we, we don't advance the kingdom of God based on our own wisdom, based on what we think is right or correct. It is based on the obey, or obedience. It is based on listening to the voice of God. So it's like Jesus, right? He said, I, I do not do anything other than what Father had said. So this is very, very important for us. So in many ways, the decision to prosper, we want to prosper, Prosper. It comes hand in hand with our decision to fight because the enemy is all around us. There is all kinds of barriers and challenges. But the moment we say we will not give up, we will continue to advance, that is when prosperity will start to come into our life. You see, Joshua and Caleb, remember what happened to them. They have been overruled, two against ten. And, and do you know that even though they were right, they were righteous, they did nothing wrong, they had to suffer 40 years of wilderness anymore, 
to, to get continue, uh, they had to do, do that. So it's like, you know, they didn't sulk, they didn't moan, and they didn't say, oh, you know, this is unfair. But they continued their fight. You know, Caleb was saying that I, I kept my body uh, fit, I'm ready, you know, I'm old, but I can still do it. So, so that's the thing. Even in, in 40 years, they kept preparing. They continued the fight. So when the opportunity came again, they were able to participate. They were fighting against the spirit of the age because there was this spirit that is trying to stop Israel from fulfilling its destiny. Eventually, they became the key leaders, the core leaders who will be leading Israel into the promised land. Now, this is what Lance Warnow said, and I find it very instructive in the month of Alf. And he said, forget rapture as an escape. You see, some people are still thinking it will be rapture, will be, you know, bring, you know, go to heaven, etc., etc., and he said, don't use the word rapture, but use the word, try the word translation. And translation is it, it, like there's a morphing, there's a changing of form as an act of defiance by a remnant who refused to succumb to the spirit of this age. So we do not give in to what the spirit, the atmosphere is trying to tell us. Instead, we will bring heaven's kingdom rule on earth. We have the authority to bring heaven to earth. And that is our job as believers and ecclesia. We have a task to cause earth to look more like heaven before Jesus will return once again. So we need to continue the fight and we need to have the escalation spirit. Now, in fact, I was just reviewing what I taught uh, last year. You know, every time I, I do a first fruit teaching, I always look at what I taught last year. I always try to listen to, to what Robert is teaching from Glory of Zion, I always try to hear what the prophets are saying. And, and so I was reviewing last year's teaching and I was talking about the escalation spirit. Now, I find that teaching still very useful. And, you know, you can just do a search, try to find our uh, last year, 2020. And, you know, I encourage you to review that teaching because it will be very helpful still. Now, let's recall what happened in the month of Tammuz. Now, we talked about it a little bit already. Now, we, we know the month of Av was not a very good month historically for Israel. Many bad things happened, but it all started off when the spies came back and, you know, gave a, a terrible report. But they were sent out the month before in the month of Tammuz, but they finally returned the following month, which is now. The man of Av. So when we look at the despairs, all the bad things, I'm not going to go into it today. You can read it, you know, in time to advance. We have talked about it in previous uh, teaching before. But the foundation, or, or maybe a, a better word, is, is we're talking about the root issue. The root of all the problems in Av comes from the previous month, the month of Tammuz. See, the, the 10 spies who gave the bad report, bad confession, whatever you want to call it, they reported what they have seen accurately in the natural. So they were not wrong in the natural. They say, oh, these people, they are strong, they are mighty, their walls are thick, it's fortified cities or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And it, it is correct. It is 100% correct in the natural. But in the eyes of God, that is a false report. That is a terrible confession. It, it is something that shows their true heart. You see, they had the natural sight. They can see things. They can analyze it. So that's the danger when we become too natural. We, we don't put on the spiritual lenses because they forego all the spiritual discernment. And worse, they forego the faith. Everything they reported is 100% accurate factually, but it shows a complete lack of faith in God's ability to bring them through. So, so that was a, a major issue. What happened was that they succumbed, they gave in to the spirit of the age. That, that's why this year, the year of contrast and contention, 5781, the red dragon versus the, the, the sound of the lion of Judah, it is so important with the pandemic, with the lockdown, with all the economic, social challenges that we're facing, so many people are losing the perspective or the voice of God. They're giving in to fear. 
and they're giving in to the spirit of the age, the spirit that is surrounding, that is not wanting the believers and the ecclesia to prosper. So this is something that we have to be very sensitive to. So the ten spies, they succumbed to that spirit, but also, of course, the giants of the land, the Nephilims, or all these, you know, it, all these combined together to create that kind of fear. And eventually it caused them to give a false confession. And this false confession did not just condemn them, did not just condemn their own tribes, but it condemned the entire nation into 40 years of wilderness. It caused an entire generation, a few million of them, to totally miss out on their destiny. That, that's very serious. You know, I, I, I don't even know. Uh, you know, we, we don't know what will happen to them. You know, are they safe or not? Things like that. You, you know, if, if these kind of things happen, how are you going to give an account to God? So, we need to remember that the majority is not always right. In fact, from a biblical perspective, the majority is often wrong. You see, throughout the history of the church, throughout the history of the Bible, God had always chosen to work with smaller groups. He, he chose to work with the minority, with what we call the remnant. For example, Abram, he was the first to cross over. He was called the Hebrew, you know, in fact, the, the meaning of Hebrew is the one who crosses over. And he was one of the first to have a true everlasting covenant with God. Then his grandson Jacob, you know, and, and from a family, just a family, he will establish a nation. God will cause his family to become a nation that will be a blessing to the entire earth. That, that's Jacob. Then when we look at the early church in New Testament, God chose 12 disciples and, and this, when you look at them, you're like, the future of the church are in these people and, and, and you, you kind of get a bit worried. But Jesus caused them to be the foundations. You know, Ephesians 2.20 talk about the foundations of the churches are apostles and prophets and they will become ecclesia. It will be a force that, that will shape Roman Empire eventually it will shape Western civilizations and even the entire world forever. Then when we look at the historical restoration of truth, you know, we talk about uh, church history, the last 500 years, we, we, we talk about people like Martin Luther, we talk about John Wesley. God always starts with just one person. One person when they are praying and all of a sudden, they get a revelation and, and God put in the seat of reformation inside them and then it becomes a restoration of truth mo moment. So we need to understand that God always and often choose to use the minority, the remnant. And, and, and that's why this is a season where we have to be very sensitive and, and begin to discern what is the minority report out there that God wants me to, to discern. So that's why God is now causing us to begin to pay more attention, be more sensitive, be more spiritually sensitive to what I call minority report. And, and this is in relation to our discernment, to our sensing. Now, let me just give you a little bit of context, okay? Because we, we have to look at what's happening around the world in order to understand what God is doing. See, in relation to the pandemic, I think pandemic is a, is a good example. Everyone is going through that, have some form of experience. Now, in relation to this, we have been told that certain things must be done to end it. So, right from the beginning, there is this discussion, there is this proposition, whatever you want to call it, and it's all we have to do this. So, first they say, flatten the curve, you know, so that our hospital system can, can cope. And then they start to come up with this term, herd immunity. And, and you all should just begin to do some research because herd immunity it is something, yeah, it has been done before, but it, it will take 40 years, it will take 50 years. You know, we talk about things like polio, but to say that you need herd immunity before we can come back to being normal, that, that's really a bit crazy. And, and that's why now you're seeing nations, even like Singapore and, and United Kingdom, they are walking away from this concept. Even our own vaccine minister, you know, KJ was saying, you, you know, he doesn't think it can be achieved. Then we talk about mass vaccination. And now it's almost like compulsory vaccination. 
you know, I've been hearing stories about how the authority will go house to house trying to quote unquote and un- uh, encourage. And, and sometimes I, I, I'm just talking to even believers and Christians and, and they're like, oh, there's nothing wrong with that because you, you have, we have to have the spiritual perception to understand what's behind all this. And then, of course, all the things about lockdown and things like that. Now, I, I'm not here to talk very extensively here, uh, but if you're interested in these sort of discussions, uh, governmental, political discussion, in fact, I, I, I do have a podcast called, called Simon Says. You, you can just uh, type it in Spotify Apple podcast or whatever, and, and you get in, and we'll have a, it's a bit longish, you know, 25 30 minutes kind of you know, monologue discussion. Um, but if you are interested in those kind of things, that that will be the place where, where we talk about, and we'll be we'll do that in a more covert way in ways that doesn't touch on the spirituality of things in a very direct way. But but there is the element of spiritual, um dynamic behind all these things, okay? So many of the ideas and philosophies, you know, the one I just talked about, are driven by the majority power brokers. You know, I like to call them the elites, okay? The globalists, you know, whatever term you want to use. But basically, those people with immense power to shape the policies surrounding all the the major governments of, of the world. And this is something we can call groupthink now. So, so that's why, you know, if you're interested in this kind of thing, remember, I just talked about the podcast that you can go and that, that is a place we try to do it once a week and talk about the various issues. So this group thing is what you can call a natural. So it looks like natural, but when you begin to discern and go deep, there is a spiritual part of it and it is all a mind control. For what? It is to push an agenda. There is an agenda that is going against what God wants to do on earth. That is why as believers and as Ecclesia, we have to be sensitive to all these things. We have to pray because our job is to be intercessors. We are to stand in a gap. We are to be priests to bring the issues. Then we are to be kings to bring down the command, the mandate from heaven so that heaven will eventually invade earth in such a way that caused the kingdom of God to advance. So, so that, that's the, the nutshell of our assignment and we must not lose sight of that even in the midst of this uh, great pandemic, okay? So coming back to group thing, and, and some of you may be able to see, you may not be able to see that, but you will, you, you will begin to notice that if you want to have a debate against certain things, you have disagreement, so, you know, when we talk about lockdown, when we talk about vaccine, you know, you know, just people raising certain doubts ab- about the efficacy or whatever issue, uh, you know, or even legitimate scientific discussion, all those are not being allowed. And we have seen that with, with the beat technology company and social media and, and the dominations of the media, they, are, they, they have the power to do that. So that's why it is both a natural and spiritual phenomena that is happening right before our eyes. So the group thing, now coming back to the group thing, you know, basically it is it, the way that they formed the mindset. And I'm just talking about one topic here, which is the pandemic response. And you can really trace it back to a cocktail, a mixture of spiritual influences. So when I use spiritual influences, Actually, I, I'm talking about territorial spirit. So these are not small spirit. These are major, major spiritual forces that can really cause a havoc even in the kingdom of God. So, so we, we have to understand there is that spiritual root out there. So the first thing, of course, there is Python. You know, Python spirit. We know Python spirit is in operations in Malaysia, in Sarawak. And basically, you know, Python, that, that's the spirit that is operating in Philippi, you know, when Paul was kind of casting it out from, from the servant girl. And, you know, it's like a snake and it chokes and it drains people of their energy. So what happened after a, a, a while with the python is people and even believers, they begin to lose the ability, the spirit to fight back. Otherwise, ah, oh, they're so tired. And, you know, they, they give in. Then you have Leviathan. We talk about Leviathan extensively in our marine spirit course, but it's basically a mind control. And Leviathan is just a spirit of 
of deception. It, it tells a lot of lies. And it, it's really today you can see through the false voices. Uh, it, it's happening in such a major way in mainstream media. You know, the way they use propaganda, their tools, their agents. So, so, so really, my friends, you know, as believers, we have to open our natural eyes. So, so one of the things is we have to understand what's happening in the natural. And then God will fill in the gap and give us the prophetic revelation so that we are able to, to do what we're supposed to do as believers. Then you have the spirit of Babylon. And this is really can be summed up as governmental lawless structure. It's just that the government will do whatever they want to do. They will trample to the people without care. They don't care about the suffering of the people. They don't care about the destruction of the nation. And unfortunately, in Malaysia right now, we are seeing the Babylonian spirit happening. And we just have lawlessness at a very, very high level. And that's why we have to understand what is happening. Then, of course, there is a religious spirit. It is always there. And... What religious spirit does is it causes people to continue to unreasonably accept status quo. So with all the restriction of freedom, with emergency that's happening, so many people are just saying, oh, it has to be done, it has to be done. But I, I'm glad to start to see that people are, are beginning to question the rationale of it because the only way people can wake up from religious spirit it is when they are suffering enough. When there is just such a major shake-up that they are like, oh, I'm, I'm suddenly awake. What, what's happening right now? So you, you can see the religious spirit is causing a lot of people in slumber. You can see a lot of Christians are stuck in all wine skin, not able to see the new things God is doing. So all these are the cocktail, the mixtures of, of the forces behind the group thing, the majority report that I've been talking about so far. So the group thing essentially represents the majority report. And the way they do it will be, it will present something that appeals to the natural senses. It will do something that speaks to anxieties, to fear. That, that's why you realize that the spirit of fear was the first thing that really come out. And, and there's this all kind of reporting about how you can get COVID and things like that. And, and most are just totally nonsense. But... The, the effect remains even when there are many scientific reports and experiments that disprove this allegation that the first negative report remains because that's how fear works. It sticks with the people. It gets stuck in the mind of the people unless they are free from that. So this majority report, they seek to, to form dominant mindset. So they want people to behave in a way because that is the way you control people. That is the way you cause people to become slaves. It starts with the mind. You see, slavery is not really about imprisonment. It is not like you are being confined to places. That's why for Israel, even though they were in Egypt for 300 plus, almost 400 years, the prison was not really the physical boundary. It's not like they, they were stuck in Goshen. But even when they came out, they still couldn't get Egypt out from their mind because it starts with the mind. This is how powerful this group thing and majority report is all about. Now, interestingly, now I'm talking about this and some of you will be like, oh, you know, I, I know the movie. So if you have seen the movie Minority Report, you can see a similar thing. In fact, it's very interesting that I've been talking about Minority Report in my podcast and today. And all of a sudden, I was just checking, hey, the movie is suddenly available to be watched on Netflix in Malaysia. You know, it has not been available. And... Mm. It's just very interesting. I, I think it is a movie of the season. If you have not seen it before, I really want to encourage you to see it because it, it, it's just... It, I mean, it's good entertainment. It's Tom Cruise, it's Spielberg and things like that. But there's all the other stuff which really begins to, to help us to navigate through some of the issues here. So two things from the movie that really jump out. The first thing, now I'm not going to say too much that will spoil the movie, okay? So, so if you don't like to be spoiled of any movie, you know, just, I don't know, <laughs> turn away for one minute or so. But in the movie, the first thing is there is a control system. And, you know, the whole premise of the movie is they have a system to predict the future. So, you know, they have, a, they have three beings, you know, they are like sort of like mutants, uh, you know, and they have a, what they call they are called pre you know, precognition. They are able to predict the future through certain things they see. 
So based on that, they go and round up people and arrest people and imprison them based on the possibility of committing the future. So it is a pretty scary thing. So that's why I say it's based on pseudo and questionable data because they never uh, kind of let people know how the precognition works, okay? Now, the second part, of course, and this is where we come into the title of the movie, Minority Report. So remember, I mentioned you had the three beings and they usually give re reports. So usually the three of them will all agree, or oh, this person has done that, this person has done this. But on rare occasions, one of them will give a dissent, will disagree with the other two. So, so this is what we call there is a dissent and disagreement within the data structure. And that's why it, it becomes minority report. So in the movie, it, you know, it, it's such a rare thing, but when it happens, the investigators are trying to find out what really went wrong. Okay, so that, that is how we get the term minority report. So what do we make of the minority report? Now, I've, I've been talking a lot about the majority report, the, the demonic cocktail and things like that. But what about the minority report? Now, we need to remember that just because you're in the minority doesn't mean you're always right. And sometimes people can be imagining things. You are, you are you know, this happens to, to all of us, okay? But I, I want to talk more in, in the perspective of what the law is doing all around the world. You see, you see the law, and it is the pattern of God. He will use the weak to shame the strong. I, I mean, he has always done it before. See, in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And then we think about Israel. You know, Israel was one of the most insignificant nations, you know, compared to Babylon, compared to, to Persia, compared to Egypt, you know, all the nations. They were so insignificant. But today, you look at the Jews, you look at the Hebraic mindset, you know, the success they have in economy, in science, in every field. They have the most lawyers and doctors in percentage than any other race. I mean, it, it is not... You know, you, you can actually get the data to support that they are the smartest people group in the entire world. And I, I think not many people would disagree. So God has always chose the small things. Now, I remember years ago, you know, when Sini Jaco was in, in Kuala Lumpur, in fact, and, and, and there was, you know, I think right after 2008, you know, 2008, we had the political tsunami. So a few years later, he, she came and then she was talking about the, the next step of advancement for Malaysia. And then she said the next prophetic intercession, the next level will come from East Malaysia. Now, those of you who have been in the Christian circle for a long time, uh, you know that the West Malaysians always consider more advanced and having more training, more access to good materials, good teachers. So very often the churches in East Malaysia, they'll be like, oh, can we get someone from KL, from Penang, from Singapore, you know, whatever, just to come and train us. So when Sini prophesied that the next stage of prophetic intercession, the leadership will come from the East Malaysia, I thought a lot of people couldn't really understand that. And we really see the last 10, 15 years, the new move of God really have mushroom more from there. It's like the West Malaysian have sort of brings the, the charismatic movement into the, the fullest of what they can. But when, when God moved into the apostolic prophetic, the saints movement, He chose to do it because it, it, it's the same principle. He, he will use the weak. He will use the foolish. Now, when, we use, when you see the Greek word foolish here, it's not referring to intellectually inferior. It's not referring to your, your IQ is lower, your technical knowledge is lower. It's not talking about that. It refers to things which the world deems as insignificant, as unimportant. So it's like, most likely, it's like you're very small, your bargaining power is like non-existent, that, that sort of thing. It's not because you are stupid or anything, but it's just the, the, the people, the, the, the larger group, the majority, they deem you insignificant. So, so it, it, it's like the same thing, you know, it, it, it's like, it's like what we're seeing right now. There's this contention out there. Remember that the whole theme of 5, 7, 8, 1, the Lion of Judah versus the Red Dragon. And whoever would take hold 
of the voice of the Lion of Judah, no matter how small and how insignificant you are, God will begin to use you to shame the wise and powerful. I mean, this is His word and He's going to do it again and again and again. So God chose the ones. So that's why the, the minority is not just because you are small. It's not just because you are cast aside. It, but it is because you are also humble. You are willing to be obedient. You are faithful to the kingdom agenda. You do not have your own agenda. You do not have your own plans and mindset. You say, Lord, I leave it to you. And, and then God will say, I can then use you. We can be part of this select group. It, it is a select group, but the criteria is we have to, to be willing. We have to be humble. You see, God's ways can sometimes look slow. It can look insignificant. And it's like, you know, you're, you're like the minority report. Remember Joshua and Caleb, their reporting look like it's wrong. And they're like, we can do it, we can do it. And the other 10 is, you know, remember the story, if, if you read carefully, the other 10, they were rallying the rest of Israel to, to stone them, to kill them. And that was how bad it was. And Moses was like, oh my, oh my, you know. And before he could even do anything, the cloud of God came and he was like, I am going to put an end to this. And, you know, it, it did not end well that day. So that's why those of us, when we allowed the humility and, and, and the willingness to be shaped by God, we can become the minority report. We can become the light of Joshua and Caleb that has an impact over their nation. And when we are willing to do that, we will be authorized with the power and authority of Jesus. Because remember in Acts 1.8 and Matthew 28, and he was about to ascend into heaven. He said, All authority has been given to me, therefore I... You know, and he was given to a very, very select group of people you know, the 12 disciples and, and some other people, not more than 120. So it's a very tiny, tiny... In fact, the Roman authority initially, they called this a minor Jewish sect. But 100, 200 years later, historian was saying, Christians are everywhere. You know, at, at that time, it estimated they have 500,000 Christians in Ephesus alone. It's just an amazing build out. So the minority report will be given the authorization. And they will become the true sons of God. Remember Psalms 115, 16 says, God will give the earth. The earth shall be inherited by the sons of man, by, by those that God has apportioned them to be. So here's a quick uh, comparison between the majority report and the minority report. Okay, So with the majority report, the, the path is wide. You can believe what you want. So today that's happening and people read newspaper, they consume whatever things in social media. They believe what they want to believe. There is freedom to do that, but that is not the way of God because the way of God is the minority report. It's a narrow path. It is based on truth and revelation of God. Now with the majority report, it creates groupthink. And that's based on the lies of Satan. I already show you all the cocktail of the territorial spirit. But with the minority report, we, we present truth that is based on accurate spiritual perception because we see in the natural, we have to learn how to perceive in the spiritual. Basically, that means to be able to see from the perspective of God. And, and, and that's all there is in terms of spiritual perspective. When we see things from God's perspective, we all of a sudden we get a different understanding. The majority report focused overly on the natural. So remember the 10 spies, they reported accurately, 100% accurate in terms of the natural. But it speaks to the comfort of the emotions and soul because they understood people are fearful, people are tired, people are weary, they are not looking forward to war. They, you know, so they are saying, oh, it's very difficult. The wars are fortified. You're not just giving all kind of nonsense and, and they're like, okay, let's give up, let's give up, let's give up prosperity. But the minority report, we are not throwing away our natural perception. We, we consider both natural and spiritual. That, that's the difference. The difference is the end part. So when we see the natural is difficult, 
right? I, I mean, it is difficult. How, how many times have you, you, you know, you, you are in a discussion, you are thinking about taking a major decision, have you spoken to a prophet and, and to an authority structure in your life, and they will say, hmm, it is difficult. You, you know, uh, I think about, you know, e Elisha was asking Elijah for the double anointing, and he was like, hmm, it's difficult. In the natural, it's difficult, but in the, in the spiritual, if you will allow yourself to rise above the limitation of the natural, then there is a path. Now, with the majority report, it, it tends to follow the ways of the world, the pride in human strength. And, and that's why so many things, when you think about the group thing and, and what they are saying is based on, they say, oh, this is a science, we are the elite group and things like that. But I am really glad to report that more and more of these people are being exposed. They are exposed with fake data, they are exposed with a hidden agenda, they are exposed with conflict of interest. So there's a lot of pride there, but at the end of the day, the pride will bring them out. With the minority report, it, it, it's like this, the minority gained the remnant, the ways rejected by the world. So the, the world is saying, this is not the way to do it, but God is going to use the ways rejected by the majority and it will be used to humble them. Finally, those people who embrace the majority report, they, because it appeals to their soul, it appeals to their emotions, they are easily manipulated by the fear of, and the red dragon. That, that's what's happening right now. Right? I, I, mean, I mean, the last six months, one year, I, I've just seen tremendous amount of fear, even among believers. I, I mean, if, if you're not a believer and, and you get fearful, I, I think it's normal. But for believers to lose hope, to say that there's no way out. That, that's really giving in to the spirit of fear, giving in to Red Dragon. With the Minority Report, we are going to accept, embrace the Lion of Judah. That's why in terms of the yearly perspective, remember the last three months, Tammuz, Av and Elu, we want to end really, really strong well. Okay, I'm going to wrap up already in, the, in just a couple of slides to go. Just going back again, let, let's talk about the original purpose, the original redemptive blessing of Av. It, it is supposed to be a month of great opportunity. The spies were supposed to come back and say, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. It is exceedingly good. We can take it. Our father heard the property words from God and we will be the ones to claim it, to take possession. It was supposed to be a great month. It was supposed to be a time that embraced the true report of the promised land. It is true. After 400 years, it is true. They were supposed to enter in and take possession with all the celebration and glory. But in the same way, you know, remember in Genesis 4, sin entered into the world, Genesis 3, Genesis 4, the promise, this is the promise to Abraham, the promise that his descendants would, would, would possess the promised land. It has been perverted. The promise was for a new promised land, for cities they do not have to build, for all the things, for victories. So all those are now perverted. And because of that, Israel went into cycles of wilderness. And that this, you see, the thing about wilderness is like this. God caused us to go into wilderness so that we suffer for a period of time. And I was just talking to, to another person. And I said, Malaysia went into a circle, a cycle of wilderness with the, with the PN government because we need to, to experience greater suffering. You know, PN is an experiment of a single race, single religion, dominant kind of government. So we get a taste of what it is like. Total, a high level of governmental incompetence. I, I mean, I'm not, mean, I'm not mincing my word here, but it, 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 is, it is what it is. I, I, I say what I see, and, and it is like that. So we, we, we go into a cycle of wilderness so that we see what we're getting into. So it, it, it's the same way right now, even in many, many nations that they are being forced to go into wilderness to consider what is before them. So Israel went through that with the man of Av and throughout the next 
few thousand years, they experienced so many bad things, even recent history with World War II, etc., etc. So unless they chose to rise above it. So that's why I already mentioned, it, it seems like we're in these uh, unending cycles of despair, unending cycles of wilderness. But God, everyone says, but God, He will actually give a way. And why is this way? It is a way for us to rise now. Of, of course, He can just say, oh, I, I pluck you out from, from the water or things like that. But more often, He'll be like, this is the path I need you to rise up yourself. I need you to rise above the noise, the fear, the fire of the red dragon. So that's why we need to learn to rise up above the noises and fear in this season. And, and one of the things is we need to learn to shut down the voices that promotes fear. Fear is just such a dangerous thing. You know, we, we have to just put a stop. And if you're in a circle, you have friends, you have people that keep on talking about things that doesn't encourage you, it, it is time for you to disconnect with them. I, I know some of you will be thinking, oh, it's so harsh, don't be so serious. But you, you have to ask yourself, I, I, I don't know what kind of condition you are in. You know, are you being influenced by all the negativity? But we have to learn to shut it down. We have to learn to shut down the restlessness in the land. That means all the news, all the rumbling, all the things that cause just the feeling of not being settled, the feeling of dis disturbance on the land. And, and then, of course, coming back to what we're doing today, first fruit worship, we have to embrace first fruit worship like never before. And, and really, that's the key because it opens the portal. It allows us to see God. It allows us to hear God in, in ways we've never seen before. We need to truly understand what it means to give our very best. In, in whatever area, you know, all of us struggle in different areas of our first fruit. But when we ask God, and He will give a ratification. He will give a way for us to, to kind of fix out the messes that we're in. So as we press in, and this is what is going to happen, I believe. The Lord will cause our voice to be a minority report. And it's like some of you will be like, oh, but I want to be the majority report. No, you know, and, and you know, when I was preparing this, all of a sudden, now I, I knew this before, but it has never been highlighted like that before. When you look at Old Testaments, even New Testament prophets like John the Baptist, like Apostle Paul, the, the disciples, they were always the minority. Do you realize that? The one who wants to speak the truth is always in the minority because the minority report is a truthful, it's a piercing voice. It's something which the kings of the land do not want to hear. It is the, it is the voice that the power brokers, they do not want to hear. But it is a voice to the land as mandated by heaven. So let me just finish off by sum, summing out what the month of Av is all about. It is all about choosing the ways of God. There are so many options for us. We have to choose to give up fear. We have to choose to press in. We have to choose not to, to be entangled into all the different spirit, the group thing, the majority report. But when we choose the right thing, then we will be in a place it will cause us to be in a place where we can begin to truly prosper. So that's all I have for today. And you know, I, I'm glad that you can tune in this morning with us. So now it, it, if you miss this, you can uh, or if, if you miss a portion of this, this teaching is always available for replay. Now, just a reminder again, do not forget the the try advancing school we have this afternoon. And tonight you can join the, the Cebu uh the, their first fruit celebration on Zoom, which will be a blast, I'm sure. So that's it for now. Bye bye and God bless.